Hey everybody, welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction, uh, the uh, great show every week where we talk about the amazing topics in infertility and review all of the hot topics and interesting news that's out there for you guys, uh, bring out the truth, help empower you to make good choices and to hopefully save you time, effort and a whole lot of money. So uh, we always take a few minutes to let everyone get on board and uh, we're going to do that tonight again. Take about five minutes, grab your popcorn or whatever you like and uh, some kind of snack, a cup of coffee, tea, uh, hopefully something healthy and uh, we'll get started. Just let everybody join on. Tonight's topic is an interesting topic, uh, mainly because it was really big news a few years ago and a lot of the places that were promoting doing the genetic testing like PGT were tacking on this additional test called a mitoscore or a mitochondrial DNA score. So mitochondria is the energy factory in your cell. And if you don't know this already, all of the mitochondria inside you actually come from your mother. So the father's sperm does not contain any mitochondria which contributes to uh, the fetus. It's all coming from the egg. And so the belief was if you have a variable level of mitochondrial DNA, maybe your egg is not as efficient and so perhaps those embryos are not going to be as good. The theory being that if you had a low number of mitochondrial DNA, then the chance that the embryo is energy efficient is high and so you don't really need any more, um, you know, sort of energy efficiency or, or energy apparatus in there to help produce more sort of resources for the cell, for the embryo. Whereas if you had a high number of mitochondria, it probably means it's a weaker egg because you need a lot more of these little energy factories to produce what's necessary for the cell or the embryo to maintain its normal operations. So the theory was low mitochondrial DNA would probably be good, high mitochondrial DNA would probably be bad. And so people actually went off and started studying this, analyzing Analyzing it and determining you know how significant the risks were what the numbers were and so on and how much of a role this actually played in everything so um, there are a number of studies for this and most recently Richard Scott who is really kind of one of the smartest and brightest guys in all of infertility uh, he just pro published a study, or at least is in the process of publishing a study um, in Reproductive Biomedicine Online, and the article is entitled Mitochondrial DNA Content is Not Predictive of Reproductive Competence in Euploid Blastocysts. Now, just to give you a comparison, last year, February, so just a, a year and a half ago, there was an article in Fertility and Sterility in titled Mitochondrial DNA Copy Number as a Predictor of Embryo Viability. And their final conclusion is, as is common with new tools, this attention has led to both inflated expectations and serious disillusionment. Here we gather evidence to establish the true clinical applicability of this method. Controversy continues to surround this topic, adding both interest and confusion. So even a year ago, there were studies that were saying, yes, this is still good, and other studies just starting to come out that were saying, no, this is not that useful. So Richard Scott studied this in a very, very interesting way. And I thought I'd bring this to your attention because this is one of those things where sometimes you can end up paying extra for it. You might have to add in extra dollars to get this testing done. And the idea is that maybe you can predict which embryo is going to do better and by predicting which embryo is going to do better, you're going to end up with a better result and a better outcome. So really the question was, how useful is this? And so Richard Scott developed this very ingenious study where he had sort of three different arms to the, the research project. Number one was just sort of validating the amount of mitochondrial DNA in each cell. So that's kind of boring scientific stuff. I won't get into that with you. It's not really important other than to say their method was validated. They made sure it was accurate before they went ahead and started running their study. The second one was to look at embryos purely that were euploid, meaning they had been tested and were genetically normal. And in those embryos, they were looking for the amount of mitochondrial DNA to see if it made a difference, comparing 
all embryos to one another. So our embryos to your embryos to the next person's embryos and so on. And then the last part of it was testing to see if sibling embryos were different in the mitochondrial DNA content when one implanted and one didn't. So let's say a you know, mini mouse went and did her IVF protocol. She made a bunch of embryos and they implanted one and it didn't take and then they implanted another one from that same egg retrieval and it did take. They were comparing the mitochondrial content from those two embryos to see if there was a substantial difference. So really neat study because you're really diving deep into the basics here, deep into the information, and you're hopefully going to come up with an answer that provides people with very sort of formidable, rational data that they can help to use making a decision. <clears throat> so they looked at 615 euploid genetically normal human blastocysts used in single embryo transfers at a center called RMA in New Jersey and Reproductive Medicine Associates is one of the, the very large fertility centers in the US. They have locations all over the place and now they've merged with IVI from Spain. So I believe they're the world's largest IVF company. Um, Richard Scott kind of heads it all. The man is an absolute genius and uh, he's a, a very bright and talented man um, running the show there. So basically they said they had no restrictions on maternal age, clinical diagnosis, or number of previous attempts. So this was like all comers. But what they did exclude were people that had any endometrial problems where their lining couldn't be more than seven millimeters or if the blastocyst had to go up until day seven. So there is good data out there that shows that if it takes you till day seven for the blastocyst to develop, the results are not as strong as what they would be if it's a day five or a day six blastocyst. So all of these embryos had previously undergone testing. They had the biopsies from the embryos and they were then able to take those biopsies, reanalyze them for their mitochondrial DNA content, and then compare the two groups. So the very interesting parts of this, just kind of going over the demographics, maternal age at the time of oocyte collection was anywhere from 21.8 to 45.3. So you've got the younger patients and you got the older patients. And they had a phenomenal rate of implantation. So this is a very you know, well-run organization. This is a high rate of success. Per single embryo transfer, they were getting 68.5% continued pregnancy at nine weeks with a positive fetal heartbeat. So that's very, very good. So what they said was there was no association found uh, between the mitochondrial DNA content and sustained implantation rates. So the statistical significance was not there and it was not associated with other factors, for example, between maternal age at oocyte collection. So they didn't even find that the mitochondrial DNA content was actually related to your age, which is something that's being proposed many times because what they've said is, as women age, you're getting those weaker eggs and those weaker eggs will be the ones that are also less energy efficient. And if they're less energy efficient, then again, you might have a lower chance. Years ago, we had a company that was really big into this um, and they're a very well-known company and uh, they actually were saying that this is a very critical test that we should do for patients because they were grouping patients into uh, quartiles, which is when you divide it into four separate groups. And they said that the difference in implantation between the low mitochondria and the high mitochondria was a 60% difference. So the ones that had high mitochondrial DNA had a 20% implantation rate whereas the ones that had the low DNA content had an 80% implantation rate. So they were really promoting this saying everybody should be testing for it. Well, Richard Scott saying that doesn't even exist in terms of age, let alone between embryos. So they have this really interesting stuff and I'm gonna share the screen with you guys so you can see it. Um, give me one sec. For those of you on Instagram, uh, we can't share, but I'll share the picture with you. So. That's kind of the first graph that we're looking at and it's just a scatter plot, okay? So in the pink on this side, 
are the ones that failed and on the blue on the other side are the ones that succeeded. As you can see, this is your mitochondrial DNA content. And for those of you watching on uh, the other platforms, here's your relative mitochondrial DNA. Here is failure versus success for sustained implantation. You can see those scatter plots are basically identical. Doesn't matter what your relative DNA content was, you're still gonna get the same number of failures and the same number of implantations. So then they went a little bit further and they ran something which in statistical uh, reality is a really cool test and that's called a receiver operating characteristic curve or an ROC curve. So um, I definitely don't want to bore you guys with stats but this is kind of a neat little thing for you to see so let me pull this up for you. <clears throat> so an ROC curve plots the sensitivity of a test versus the specificity of a test so that it helps you determine where there's a threshold where you can say, okay, at this level of mitochondrial DNA, we're gonna get this ability to predict whether or not the patient's gonna get pregnant or the embryo is normal or whatever your question is. And what you wanna see in a receiver operating characteristic curve, and this is the line they had, is the exact opposite of this. It should go up, go across, almost like straight up and across would be the best. So again, for those of you watching, you want this line to go straight up here and then across like that, okay? So it should rise right along the sensitivity scale, get to one and then go all the way across the specificity scale, meaning it's extremely sensitive and extremely specific. So it can rule in the normal number and it rule out the abnormal. So in other words, if you had a specific threshold, let's say 10 copies was significant, at 10 you could say if it was less than 10, you know 100% of people are not gonna get pregnant, and if it's over 10, 100% of people are gonna get pregnant. So again, because it's this straight line that I'm showing you here in the graph, and you can see it here, that is indicative of absolutely no value whatsoever to this test. It's a match in terms of sensitivity and specificity one-to-one, -one, meaning it's totally non-specific and non-sensitive, essentially a useless test. So the final part, um, what they concluded from this was that there is no benefit to doing this test. They said it doesn't predict embryo viability, it doesn't predict uh, implantation, it didn't even predict blastocyst formation as far as they could tell. Now, it does have some, some problems with the trial. Number one, it is retrospective, so they went backwards and looked at embryos that had already implanted, already been biopsied. It's always better to run this stuff in a prospective trial. Number two, <clears throat> They were looking at this from the standpoint of uh, just the questions that they were asking and they weren't looking forwards to see, hey, does the mitochondrial DNA content affect how quickly it forms a blastocyst or how long it takes to reach the, the blastocyst stage or how many of the embryo, embryos were euploid or not euploid. So, those questions are not answered, but ultimately what they've come up with here is very, very convincing data that there is no difference between the two. Even when they did the sibling pairs, which are super interesting, they still showed absolutely no difference. So the, the two embryos coming from the same patient where one worked and the other one didn't, they even had the same amount of mitochondrial DNA. The thing we need to learn from all of this, in addition to the fact that this test is useless and no one should do it, is that a lot of us, myself included, almost all the fertility specialists out there, we often want desperately to find something that will help you guys. And so when something comes out, we jump on board thinking this is a good thing for us, we can help you, know, you guys by using this test. I can give you numerous examples. We've done many of them here on the show. The ERA test is one of them. Then they came out with Emma and Alice. Um, there are multiple different things people try and, and suggest work that actually don't. One of the other ones is time-lapse uh, embryo incubators. None of these things have ever been proven to be beneficial, but when they first come out, they've got this great sales pitch. They've got an amazing marketing team. They love that kind of blitzkrieg approach to inundating you with information. Everybody's doing it. You guys should jump on board. They get these really big clinics to try it, probably for free, and they say they're doing it, you guys should try it too. 
and we all want to help plus none of us want to be left behind so we tend to jump on board so it's super important for all of us as re's and all of you guys as patients to be very picky about what you're doing don't just jump on board don't just dive into stuff that's promoted because it doesn't always actually work it's always worth trying stuff that the fertility specialist has experience with and says yes i've done this many times and it actually has been proven to have a benefit either in my practice or scientifically but just jumping on board because some company is suggesting it's working is not a good idea so the fact or fiction this week was does mitochondrial dna contact content predict embryo viability or embryo development or sustained implantation it is a fiction it does not predict anything other than a waste of money so uh, make sure you like subscribe and follow we are desperately trying to grow our youtube following and we are getting bigger by the day so make sure you let everybody else know about that too uh, and you can reach us on dr victory or you can search victory reproductive care uh, make sure you join us there we do want everybody coming on board for uh, that and we will happily be able to uh, spread the word and if anybody has sort of promoted this for you um, if you've already done it that's great it's not going to negatively impact anything but don't judge which embryo you're transferring based on your mito score or your mitochondrial score it's not actually predictive for anything so with that we're going to start taking some questions do you want to start with yours or should i start with mine or you start i don't have any <laughs> okay so dr victory any updates on funding yes so with regards to funding uh we have